everyone, and welcome again to a special edition of the Sports Wrap with Michael Kravitz. And I'm doing the show today on a Tuesday instead of the normal Thursday because the first game of the NFL season starts tomorrow, and I want to do a show before where I can preview uh, my predictions, uh, the, what I think is going to happen this year in the NFL, and also I wanted to get in really early on the like the Pirates and what's been going on with them and the Pitt Panthers before their second game. So, on YouTube, from now on, uh, the show normally has been broken into two parts, but now I'm able to put up videos or podcasts longer than 15 minutes, so I'm just going to have the whole show be one one whole part. But at the beginning of, e- at the beginning of each show, I'll do the rundown of the episode, uh, what I'll be talking about, and that way uh, you can just go to whatever part you want want to hear me give my opinions about. So, today's show, I'm going to be talking about the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, their recent struggles that they've had on the road, uh, the Pitt Panthers, uh, the the first game under the the Christ era, which was not a good uh, beginning. Uh, Also, be talking about the Steelers, how they're going to be preparing for the upcoming season. Uh, the first game gets underway next Sunday. I'll also be giving you my predictions. Uh, the winners of each division, Super Bowl, MVP, all that good stuff. Uh, and I'll also just give a few comments about uh, the negotiations so far for the, uh, the NHL to start on time. But we're going to start off with the Pittsburgh Pirates, the story of the summer for Pittsburgh. When I did last week's show, the Pirates were coming off of a two out of three series victory against the Cardinals at PNC Park. Huge momentum. Pedro Alvarez was hitting the cover off the ball. And you figure, okay, they're going to go. They got the day off on Thursday. They're going to go into Milwaukee where they have not played great in the past two or three years, but they did have a series win there earlier this year. You figure, okay, very believable that they'll take two or three. Well, it turns out the Pirates swept by the Milwaukee Brewers, who are still under 500. And, hey, I won't say that the, their lineup is not good because they have Corey Hart, but Ramos Ramirez, who's having a great year, Ryan Braun, another phenomenal year, Nigel Moore, Carlos Gomez. So they, they have, in rookie weeks, they have, they have a good lineup. It's just that their pitching has been their Achilles heel this year, and it wasn't the case against the Pirates. Because in the first game, Jeff Carson's, Gives up four runs in the first inning, only retiring one, and he has to leave the game with a hip flexor. The previous week, he had a great start against the Brewers, shut, shutting them out in, uh, through seven and two-thirds innings. But he will miss his next start. Uh, Kevin Correa will fill his spot tomorrow against the Astros. And you just hope that Carson's can come back and just be healthy again because he was pitching really well. And that game was pretty much a wash because with these Pirates – They've given up first inning runs. That's been an Achilles heel this year. And it seems like whenever they give up those runs early, it's hard for them to come back. And if you dig yourself a hole such as down by four runs, it's hard to come back. And their offense really didn't show that much. They ended up losing the game 9-3. to three. Saturday's game was a different story. A.J. Burnett pitched a great game, giving up two runs in seven innings. The only first hit he allowed was in the top of the sixth, or my mistake, the bottom of the uh, – bottom of the fifth, so it wasn't so much the pitching that game, it was the lack of offense, because prior those first two games of the Milwaukee series, the Pirates were, I think, two for 19 with runners in scoring position, and that is something a playoff contender should not do. With runners in scoring position, no matter who is up, they know that these are big at-bats, and they should deliver, and the one I can recall which sticks out in my mind, is the one by Alex Presley. At the top of the ninth, the bases are loaded, two outs. He strikes out looking. It was a 2-2 ball game. Strikeout swinging. If you go down strikeout looking, that's just showing you that you're not ready to jump the trigger. You're not ready to just hit the ball. That's you, I know he's up here because of the injury to Marte, and they just decided not to play Tabata, but Presley has to know. He has to come through. 
because that was a huge at bat and it went to the wayside. And look what happens. Bottom of the ninth, they bring in Joel Hanrahan, who I will say, Pirates have not been in many safe situations, so he hasn't been used as often as he as he should be. Throws the first pitch strike to Curry, Corey Hart, and then the next pitch, Hart homers over the wall. Gives the Brewers the walk-off win 3-2. to two. And then in the third game, James McDonald was atrocious. Uh, he couldn't get out of the second inning. He only pitched two and two-thirds. Or my mistake, he couldn't get out of the third inning. He pitched two and two-thirds. Giving up eight runs. Uh, the three-run home run by Braun, I mean, it was just un- unacceptable. It went 458 feet. It's just something is wrong with him mentally, and it's it's getting in the way of his mechanics. Uh, he's not putting the ball where he wants to. It's just he has a, still uh, over 7.00 ERA in the second half of the season since the All-Star break. It's just amazing to me that someone can be so dominant in the first half and then struggle so mightily in the second. It's just I don't know what, what there is to say. And the offense, though, did come to life in that game. But it wasn't enough because they end up losing the game 12-8 to because when the pitching is that bad, if your offense is not – Superb and extremely better than the other team. You're just not going to outscore them. And in the top of the ninth, they had runners on first and second with nobody out, and you figure, okay, they could maybe come a little closer, maybe tie this game up, but three straight outs. And uh, they were all strikeouts. So that's not how a contending team is supposed to play. And then you come into PNC Park starting on Labor Day. Six-game homestand. Three against the Astros, three against the Cubs. To the two worst teams in your division. Great way to build momentum. Jeff Locke gets his first major league start against the Astros. And Edgar Gonzalez start, started for the Astros. A Mexican league pitcher who has not won a major league game since 2009. And he ends up pretty manhandling the Pirates lineup. He goes five and a third innings, only giving up one run. One run. And it's remarkable because the Pirates lineup that they put out there, even though I did not agree with what some of the players, Brock Holt, Jeff Locke pitching, Rob Barajas hitting, and then you using a McPherson as a reliever. McPherson, Locke, and Holt are rookies. Now, granted, you should have given the Locke a start because you need to see what he could do. Beside, he gave up, in the first inning, gave up three straight hits. A bad call and then bad defense led to the runs being put up. He gave up a three-run homer to Brett Wallace in the fifth. But prior to that, ground ball that was hit towards Barmas, he double-clutched, thought he could get the guy out at second, realized he couldn't, and then threw it to first, and it was a bad throw. Couldn't Didn't get anyone out, and then the, that's what led to the three-run homer of Brett Wallace. But getting one run on a team like the Astros, I mean, they have, coming into the series, they had 13 wins on the road. That's, that's bad. They are one of the worst teams of all time. Not just they're the worst team this year, but they must be the worst teams of all time. I went to the game, and looking at their lineup, it was a minor league lineup, except for, like, Brett Wallace and Jose Altuve. Minor league lineup. And for the Pirates lineup, Brock Holt, I mean, he was hitting the ball off the cover in double and triple A. He, had a, he went two for five Sunday against Milwaukee, but I would have preferred to see Josh Harrison in there because Brock Holt... I saw the way he was looking. He was hesitant on swinging in the at-bats against the Astros pitching. And I don't know if he'll be able to handle the other teams he'll be playing, even though they're like they're the likes of the Cubs, the Mets, and the Reds. I just I don't see him providing you good quality at-bats. As a pinch hitter, yeah, I would like using him, lose, using him. But once Walker comes back, I don't think he should be starting the majority of the time. It should be Josh Harrison. Now, the only consistent bright spot uh, since the uh, Milwaukee series started was has been Garrett Jones. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, he went three for four, uh, a double, two singles. The only bad thing was that no one was on base ahead of him, which has been a problem. And it's just a shame because the Pirates are 70-64 and 64 right now, only six games over 500, two and a half back, of the Cardinals for the second wild card playoff spot. And they are two games behind the Dodgers, who are right behind the, the Cardinals. For a contending team, you need to win 
at least four of these next five games. Because if you can't take two or three from the Cubs, and you can't take two or three from the Astros at home, you don't deserve to be in the playoffs. And if they don't end up taking four to five, they are in jeopardy of not being over 500, which would be a huge collapse. Because two and a half weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, you would have never thought this team could not reach or be over the 500 mark. It would be even a worse collapse than last year. So it's really amazing, and you hope that the Pirates will be able to win tonight because the Cardinals, you know, they're going to play these teams later in the month, and they know how to beat these teams. After the 19-inning game against the Pirates, they had a day off, and then Houston came in for three games. Cardinals swept them. They have been there. They have done this. They know what it takes to win in September. The Pirates, they don't know. They don't know what it takes, but they're just going to have to rally the troops realize that they embarrassed themselves yesterday. The fan, the crowd was dead there. Uh, the last few innings or so, there weren't too many cheers. There were a lot of boos. And Wandy Rodriguez has to pitch a spectacular performance tonight, and the offense needs to get it going in this homestand. Because, I mean, granted, if you end up winning each game like one or two runs, a win's a win. But you want your offense to go on a hot streak. And what better two teams to go on a hot streak against than the Hashers and the Cubs, who have been two of the worst teams on the road. So, personally, I'm not giving up on them yet. If they don't win four out of five, I will give up on them. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. I still think going over 500 is a given. I don't think this team will collapse that, that bad to be under 500. But you just got to hope that they get things together and will – Hopefully catch the Cardinals and the Dodgers because the Dodgers have a murderous schedule. So hopefully it'll probably be, uh, it'll be between these three teams for the final wild card playoff spot. Now I want to get into the Pitt Panthers. The game was on on TV. Uh, I caught some to most of the game on online on ESPN3.com, and I was really disappointed. There were not really high expectations coming in uh, this year for Paul Christ in his first year with this Pitt team because their defense was so young and inexperienced. But losing to a one double-A team in Youngstown State, who I know 10 of 11 starters were back, but being manhandled 31-17 uh, to 17 at, at Heinz Field in front of a 40,000-plus crowd, it's, it was just unacceptable. Everything from the defense to the passing, it just it, it looked sloppy. Granted, uh, Tino Sanceri did start off the game good, but uh, the finished stat line for him, 19-30, 239 yards and a touchdown. A lot of the balls were overthrown in the second half uh, when they were trying to get come close. Uh, it all started on the first drive. They, they end up driving down the field, getting to the 13-yard line, and then Ray Graham fumbles. And Chris... The next day, he later said, I take blame for this because in practice, Graham wasn't hit as much as he should have been. Uh, the only bright spot, Ray Graham, I mean, 14 carries, 71 yards, uh, it's 5.1 yards per carry. He looked good, and I'm glad because that injury last year, I didn't know how long he would be out this year, but it looks like he's going to be plugged in there and uh, kind of back to his uh, old self. And Isaac Bennett. Uh, the backup running back, 10 carries, 42 yards. I thought he looked pretty well. He got the only, uh, he got the touchdown for the for the Panthers. Uh, but prior to the game, the breaking news was that Chris suspended six players. They didn't reveal why. And one of those players was Russell Se Russell Shell, the highly touted recruit from Hopewell, and him not being in that game probably caused Chris to use Graham more often than he wanted to. So that hurt their chances. And a few other players, starters, were suspended as well. And it's kind of a shame because coming in here, you know you want to start off uh, the season well for this pit team, especially the new coaching staff. And whatever they did, I mean, they let the other players down and they let their coaches down. And Chris has not said yet if these players will return to the team for their next game against Cincinnati on Thursday night. But I, they need them back because without them, I mean, the, you're going to probably see the same results. And 
the receivers did not look as sharp. Uh, Devin Street caught a few or caught a few nice passes, but he dropped a lot of open. Uh, he was completely wide open. He dropped open. He dropped those passes. And once again, their defense just uh, looked a mess. The the pass rush, uh, two of the defensive linemen were suspended, so they didn't have a lot of depth. And they just looked slower than Youngstown State. They didn't look as hungry, and it was just a mess all the way around. And my own opinion, I think Chris will definitely be a better coach than Todd Graham. He'll be here for a long time. I'm not a huge fan of him taking the names off the the Panthers jerseys. That's just one of the things I have. I'd like to be able to know which players are. Don't have to reference them by their number. I know that I know it's the whole we are a team. We don't want to single out certain players, but I'm not a huge fan of that because that's grow, growing up watching the Panthers. I've always been accustomed to seeing the names on the back of their jerseys. But I do give him. I applaud him for taking uh, taking uh, taking charge and suspending these players, because you want to go in there saying we're not going to tolerate this stuff. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Tino Sinceri. I don't care if you're Ray Graham. If you violate our team rules, you will be suspended. You won't play. Now, my prediction: I thought Pitt had a chance to win the Big East after this game. I'm not so sure yet. They play at Cincinnati on Thursday night, ESPN National TV. This is Cincinnati's first game. I hope they don't embarrass themselves like they did against Youngstown State. I do see them playing a, a little better. Don't know if it'll be enough for them to win. Uh, don't know too much about Cincinnati, but it's it's just gonna be it's gonna be a long season for Pitt if they don't get their defense to uh, compete any better. They don't get a better chemistry on the defense because all their all their uh, leadership is in the secondary, and there's only so much the secondary can do for you because the defensive line they're there to stop the run, they're there to rush the passer, and if they can't do those jobs adequately enough, then your defense will not do well overall in the scheme of things. And I also wanted to talk about just comment a few on the NHL labor situation. The owners, done talking, not even close with the NHL Players Association, for a deal which would start the season on time. So I don't think they're going to start on time in uh, early October, first week of October. If they don't get it done that first week, presumably I see them not starting till earliest, maybe November, end of November and end of December, only playing half the season. And one, once I, I repeated on the, another previous episode, of the show, I, I'm a hockey fan. I don't want to see 41 games played because I don't think that gives your team uh, a good chance to make the playoffs. Even though 16 of the 14 teams do, half a season isn't going to cut it. I'm a fan of the 82 games, and I want to see a full season played. So, uh, NFL season is right around the corner. Tomorrow night, the first game, on NBC, the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants. It's it's kind of amazing that the NFL is already here because I've been so uh, wrapped in the Pirates chase for the playoffs. And really, this time last year and all the previous years, you know, the Pirates have been out of it by mid-August, end of August, and probably even end of July. So I've been like all gung-ho on, you know, the preseason and the NFL season getting around the corner. So it kind of rushed up upon me. But... Talking about the Steelers, their preseason game last Thursday against the Panthers. First, I want to get into the roster cuts. The list of players that were cut from the Steelers roster. Chris Scott, no lineman. Uh, the other O-lineman, John Malecki, Ryan Lee. Uh, receivers, Derek Williams, Marquise Mays, David Gilreath, Tony Clemens, Tyler Beeler. Uh, running backs, Dewan Harris. Uh, quarterback, Jared Johnson. Uh, the D-lineman, Corbin Bryant. Jake Stoller. Uh... Forgive me if I mispronounce his name. Igben Nosun Ikponmawosa. Uh, linebackers, Marshall McFadden, Brandon Hicks. Cornerbacks, Josh Victorian, Terrence Frederick, Devon Camardi Smith. And the two surprises, O-lineman, Trey Essex. And punter, Jeremy Kapanos. When I saw the Kapanos was cut, I was really surprised. I mean, he's been on, he's been injured. And... They brought in Drew Butler 
and I thought he performed really well, and he was undrafted, and he ends up making the team. So I'm kind I'm happy for Butler. Kapanos never really had a chance to compete. Cutting Trey Essex, I was a little surprised because you figure, oh, they need depth on the O-line, but when you think about it, they got Ligurski, they got Foster, they got Adams, so th they had enough pieces in play. Now, the preseason game Thursday, one of the major in that occurred in the second half was linebacker Sean Spence. And Spence was now put on injured reserve, as well as David Castro, who will possibly come back midseason. And a new role was put on, like if you put him on the injured reserve, he will be able to return by week eight. So there's a good chance they could bring back Trey Essex because I think that would even just provide more depth, more protection for Ben if they need to rotate guys in and out. And the other cuts that's the receivers. Uh, Derek Williams and David Gilrath, and also Tony Clemens. Uh, they drafted Clemens. Uh, many people thought he was going to be uh, at least the number four or five receiver on this team. Uh, David Gilrath and Derek Williams had a pretty good preseason, but they obviously didn't do enough to get a spot because Steelers right now only have four receivers on the depth chart. Wallace, Brown, Sanders, and Cautry. So I think that's pretty interesting that they're only going to keep four be able to go in any true five wide sets if they go in five wide obviously Miller would be the fifth but I was just a little surprised by that and I was surprised they kept Baron Batch uh, Mendenhall's there Redmond, Dwyer, Rainey I was surprised but uh, I feel like they, they want to have depth at the running pack position because you, you don't know if Redmond's going to go down and Mendenhall's going to go down again so you got to keep at least five running backs because you know they weren't going to get rid of Rainey and Dwyer looked like he was a lock to make the team uh, some other surprises were Brandon Johnson, uh, linebacker, uh, who I didn't think was going to make this team whatsoever. Uh, Will Johnson, the fullback. I mean, obviously, when David Johnson got hurt, it was a given, but it's surprising that he is on this team. Also, Adrian Robinson, who was a undrafted linebacker. I, I'm just shocked that, these, that they made it. Uh, ahead of players that they drafted. But, once again, they I, I feel like Tomlin said that they needed depth at the linebacker position. So, that's why they kept all these linebackers on the team. And, on the practice squad, though, they were able to retain uh, Josh Victorian, Marshall McFadden, Jamie McCoy, John Malecki, Ryan Lee, David Gilraith, uh, Marty Smith, and Tony Clemens. So, they do have the receiver that they originally drafted who was thought to make this team. And also Charlie Batch making the team was also, I felt really happy because I've always liked Charlie Batch. thought he's a, a great guy, good quarterback. He's 5-2 in games he's had to start for the Steelers, so I'm glad that they're keeping three quarterbacks on the roster. Now going into the season opener for the Steelers, Sunday night against Denver, their offensive line will look like this. you got a left tackle, Max Starks, Left guard, Willie Colon. Center, Marquise Pouncey. Right guard, Ramon Foster. Right tackle, Marcus Gilbert. I think that is a good line. Now, normally you would have, hopefully would have had Mike Adams and David DeCastro, but that's not the case. Foster has filled in before. I think he will do fine. And Colon is back. And hopefully he will be healthy past the first game. And if he is, I think this line will do well the entire year. Definitely you will see a lot more screen passes uh, with Chris Rainey, Isaac Redman, Baron Batch. Uh, you're going to see explosive, I think you're going to see explosive punt returns and kick returns by Rainey. In the final preseason game against the Panthers, he had two, or excuse me, a punt return and a kick return called back. And both were over 60 yards, and they were due to really stupid penalties. And you, one of the calls... You, you don't really know if, if it was a true block in the back because of the replacement officials who will be starting the season. For Who knows how long they'll be there. Uh, that will be uh, just uh, very frustrating for coaches and players, but you can't, it's not, you can't blame them. It's not their fault. And I think the defense, that's the question mark for me. I think the D-line will be all right, and the linebackers, hopefully Harrison will play. If he doesn't, you're going to see Chris Carter starting. 
and I don't know what depth they have now in behind the linebacker, middle linebacker spot. Uh, obviously, you have so Stevens and Sylvester, and I guess they want Adrian Johnson now and Brandon Johnson, or Adrian Robinson and Brandon Johnson. Behind Foot and Timmons, it's going to be thin. And the secondary, uh, Ryan Mundy will be starting. Uh, I think he is an adequate starter, an adequate backup behind Clark. Of course, he struggled there in the playoff game uh, against Tebow, who is no longer in Denver. And then Keenan Lewis. I hope he steps up. He said he's going to be a Pro Bowl player this year. Kind of a bold prediction. I have a feeling he'll do well. I don't think he will be a Pro Bowler because it's his first year. You just got to hope that he performs well enough because, you know, quarterbacks are going to be licking their chops saying, okay, we're targeting number 23. Ike Taylor's on the other side going after the first-year starter. The first time starting. And Cortez Allen's your nickelback, who I think will be a solid nickelback. And then you probably have Curtis Brown as your number four. And then, of course, Paul Amalo with safety. You know he's going to do good there. So... The biggest issue, I think, will be their defense. And obviously, you know, will, how will the offense click? How will Mike do? Will he be playing the majority of the game? It, those are questions that will be key answering here down the line. And I, I have a feeling that the Steelers have a great chance of winning the game. They also have a great chance of losing. I don't know what's going to happen. I, The one thing I would be shocked about is if it's a blowout by either side. Because it's Manning's first game coming back. Uh, you don't know how he's going to react, but he's a true professional. I think he's going to play his butt off. He's going to want to prove that I still have some left in the tank. I think the, the, the Broncos' defense, though, is susceptible. So they're secondary as well. So I think it's going to be a tight game. So I, I don't know well, what will happen. But I wanted to give my preview uh, for the NFL this year, my predictions and everything. So I'm going to run down the divisions, tell you the teams that I think will be in the playoffs. So starting the AFC East, I got the Patriots, Jets, Bills, and Dolphins. I just don't think either of the teams, either of the three teams, are strong enough to take the Patriots down. Their schedule is very favorable. With the two tight, tight end attacks, I, just, I think they're too strong. They're going to win the division pretty easily. Uh, in the North, I got the Steelers, the Ravens as a wild card, Bengals, and Browns. Steelers and Ravens will be neck and neck, but I think this year. I have a feeling it'll be a split still, but I think the Steelers are going to end up with a better record than the Ravens. And the Bengals, I, I don't think they were 0-8 last year. 0-4 against the Steelers and Ravens, and then 0-4 against teams that had winning records. So they, they just didn't perform well against the, the good teams. They beat up, though, on the bad teams, which is your is what you're supposed to do, but they haven't t taken the next step yet. South, I got the Texans, Titans, Colts, Jaguars. Uh, on the West, Chargers, uh, the Chiefs is a wild card, and then the Broncos and the Raiders. I think the West... Any four of those teams can win. I just think the Chargers, with this is North Turner's probably last year, if they don't make the playoffs, I just think the Phillip Rivers and the team, they're going to play hard for him. Uh, they're going to end up controlling the division. And I also think the Chiefs, a surprise pick for my wild card, second wild card. I think with Romeo Cornell, I mean, they performed well last year when he was there at the at the end. And injuries won't hamper this team, I don't think. And I just think that with the Broncos – I think they'll have a winning record, but I don't think Peyton Manning is strong is is the only reason that can catapult them into the playoffs. I don't think the other players will play well enough to get them to the playoffs. In the NFC East, I got the Cowboys, Eagles, Redskins, Giants, NFC North, Lions, Packers is a wild card, Bears, Vikings. Uh, the NFC South, I have the Falcons, the Panthers is a wild card, Saints in third, Buccaneers in fourth. Uh, the reason I'm picking the Saints to finish third, uh, their coach. I know they have an explosive offense. I think their defense is going to take us. And I don't think Breeze will have the year he had last year. He still will be good, but he just won't have the same year. Uh, and in the West, I have the 49ers, and the Rams finishing in second, Seahawks, and then Cardinals. I think the Rams could be a, a surprise team. Uh, First-year coach Jeff Fisher, I know that they're young, but, you know, young sometimes, you know, they end up doing well in the season. Uh, the 49ers, though, I just think are too strong defense, and adding uh, Randy Moss, Mario Manningham on the offense, I just think they're going to too strong for the other three teams in the West. AFC sleeper is the Colts. Andrew Luck, great college or great college quarterback in Stanford. 
I wouldn't count out on him yet. I think he will have a phenomenal rookie year. Uh, the Colts may be a surprise team. Uh, Sleeper-wise, you know, 9-7, and seven, uh, maybe close to a playoff spot. That's what I, I could see them possibly doing. Uh, my NFC sleepers, the Redskins, RG3. Uh, the top two quarterbacks, pretty much I picked their teams. Uh, I think they have a great defense. Uh, their offense is a question mark, but I think RG3 is a playmaker. He's explosive, and I think they have a chance. I wouldn't necessarily say to win the East, and uh, the NFC East, but who knows, they could be near the wild card spot by the end of the year. My AFC champion, I know people are going to say, oh, it's because you're from Pittsburgh. I still believe. I think the Steelers have a great chance because I think their offense will click, and that's the question mark. If their offense doesn't click in it to the playoffs, if it does click, I think the sky's the limit for them. And I think my, my NFC champion is the 49ers. They were just short of missing the Super Bowl last year, but I think they're going to rack up the wins. They're going to seal home field and I think they're not going to have the, the struggles that they had in the NFC Championship game last year against the Giants. And ultimately, for my Super Bowl prediction, I had the Steelers over the 49ers because I think that the Steelers have a, have a great defense, 49ers have a great defense, but I think the Steelers' offense is better than the 49ers' offense, and that's what wins them. So mark my word, my score prediction as well for the Super Bowl was 31-49ers-20. Uh, as far as my NFL MVP goes, Matthew Stafford. I think he's going to have a phenomenal year. He's got, he's got Megatron to hook up with, uh, as well as Ban Brandon Pettigrew, who's become a, a, a beast on the at the tight end spot. Uh, I think the NFL Offensive Player of the Year goes to Andre Johnson. I just see him having a, a record-breaking year as a receiver with Matt Schaub. The Texans have an explosive offense. NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Obviously, you know, for the Steelers, I'm going with Lamar Woodley. He didn't play all last year, but the games that he were he was in, his sacks were up there. He was making plays all over the field. I just think he is that type of player who can win, who can be the defensive player of the year. And coach of the year, I'm going North Turner. Uh, it's his last, probably his last year. If they don't win, I think he's going to coach the Chargers well. The player's going to play for him hard, and he will win coach of the year because a coach facing possibly his final year there and he ends up pulling off the playoff spot, which I predict, I th that deserves you to be coach of the year in the division where any team. Uh, as far as the Steelers' MVP can goes, I think it'll be Big Ben. I know it's it's cliche to say your quarterback's going to be your MVP, but I just think he's going to have a great year under the Todd Haley's new offense. Uh, I, I might be record-breaking uh, for him, most passing yardage. Maybe he could get to 5,000. But I think with Mike Wallace back in there and Antonio Brown, Heath Miller, and Chris Rainey, I think he's going to have more targets now. And I think it's going to benefit him. And as far as the Steelers' record goes, <laughs> at the beginning or after last year, uh, before even the schedule came out, I was saying to my, my dad, 16-0. They're going undefeated. I only picked them to go 16-0 uh, once uh, since I started doing predictions back when I was six years old. Uh, and that year they finished 15 and one, so I was really close. It was the year it was Roethlisberger's rookie year. But looking at the schedule, I know people are going to say, "Oh, you're still crazy for picking this." 14 and two, I see their record being. They could lose this first game. They could lose at Dallas at the end. Those are the two games where I think they could lose. But there's also some other games on there that they could possibly lose as well. The ones with the Ravens as well. I just think this team, if the Scott, if they can click on all cylinders. The chemistry will be there, and they will be with the dominant team in the NFL. I think they will end up with the best record and the worst record, Cleveland Browns. Uh, Brandon Whedon, who's a good quarterback with Oklahoma State, uh, just coming in. I don't think they have enough offensive weapons just yet. So I think it's a down year for them, but I think they are on the right track. Uh, they will be competitive in these games. I'm not going to say they're going to get blown out every time, but I still think they'll be competitive in these games. So, that's pretty much my NFL preview. Uh, as far as the game goes tomorrow night, I think the Cowboys are going to go into the Giants stadium, uh, and they're going to steal a win. Uh, opening night, you know, the former Super Bowl champion. Last year, the Packers had a great game with the Saints. They ended up winning. I, I think the Cowboys are going to come in. They're going to steal a win, and uh, it'll be momentum for them, to, who, which I predict they will uh, ultimately take the NFC East uh, because they've been so close so many years, and I think this is Romo's year to finally make it to the playoffs and get a couple wins there as well. Uh, so uh, that'll be it for today's show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, next 
Won't be doing a show this Thursday. It won't be until next Thursday. Uh, we'll get in recap all the NFL action, especially in-depth Steelers. Talk more about the Pirates. Hopefully they're still in this race for the wild card spot. Uh, talk about the Panthers game with Cincinnati. And hopefully any updates on the NHL situation. Hopefully the negotiations will start up uh, back again. So uh, signing off, uh, you just listened to the Sports Wrap with Michael Kravitz.